All right, everybody, battle stations. We're going to get underway. I want to welcome everybody to House Hearing Room 2, where the action is. Now, Housers, what am I, what, uh, with this dinky little, what am I supposed to tap here? That what's, what, Representative Wergo? You're supposed to bring your own big hammer. Oh, big hammer. And, and, and a little, and a little pounding and, Yeah, the little, block, yeah, right, so. the pounding block. But I know that you senators can work things out with the tools that you were given. So I'll <laughs> let right. you, we, I'll let there, you figure it out. How about that? There you that? go. There we go. We can hear. I have officially called the 145th meeting of the Tennessee Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations to Order. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, if there's no objection, we'll dispense with the calling of the roll. I detect a quorum is present and appreciate that very much. Some folks are here, if not under duress, under difficult circumstances, they shall remain nameless, but thank you for um, your heroic efforts to be here. Appreciate it. First, uh, Item of business on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the January meeting. So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. Thank you, Mr. Cardwell. Any uh, changes or questions about the minutes is submitted. Been properly moved and seconded. Hearing none, all in favor of approval signify by saying aye. aye. Are there any opposed or abstaining? That's great. It's unanimous and they're duly approved. Wonderful. We'll move on to tab two. Um, clipping right along, our commission and staff update by Dr. Lippard. Cliff? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, to kick things off, we're going to have a very brief update from uh, Dr. Matt Owen on the, some uh, more, uh, more recent updates on information on both federal and state broadband grants. I'll just take a few minutes. Matt? Matt, I hope you won't overlook the fact that the General Assembly <clears throat> put a little more money into the effort that you've championed here going forward, but I'll leave that up to you. I'll, I'll see if I can get to it. We'll see. Cliff, Cliff told me I wasn't allowed to just go through the whole report again, so <laughs> I'll be brief. Uh, but anyway, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commission. Uh, so as was mentioned today, I'll be providing uh, a brief update on some of the efforts to uh, improve broadband access and adoption in Tennessee, uh, and including a specific focus on two uh, programs, specifically the Federal Connect America Fund auction, and of course the uh, Tennessee Broadband uh, Accessibility Grant. Uh, both of these programs are designed to help broadband providers um, expand coverage in unserved areas uh, by offsetting the cost of deploying broadband infrastructure. Uh, so first, uh, the Federal Connect America Fund auction. Um, the auction, uh, the CAF auction, is one of the programs uh, that was described in the Commission's 2017 broadband report. Um, for that uh, report, we only had preliminary information on the auction, but since that time, the Commission has finalized additional information about its procedures. Uh, and some of the eligible areas, and so that's what I'm going to try to update you on today. Uh, a brief bit of background, the CAF auction is one of several programs under the Federal Communications Commission's Connect America Fund. Uh, these programs all, uh, in varying capacities, offer funding to internet service providers for expanding coverage in unserved areas, and they are nationwide. Uh, funding for these programs, including the auction, is provided through the Federal Universal Service Fund, which itself is funded uh, by a fee on uh, wireline and wireless telephone subscribers or subscriptions. Um, the updated information about the uh, CAF auction was uh, just released, some of it uh, actually just this spring. So in February, the FCC released the final list of eligible census blocks for the auction. And if you look at the first map behind the memo on tab two, uh, you'll see a map of Tennessee with the eligible census blocks for the auction colored in in uh, purple, I think it is on that map. Um, and with that list of eligible census blocks, the FCC also included the number of homes and businesses in each block that uh, winning uh, auction bidders will have to expand coverage to as part of the program. So for Tennessee, just in terms of the general counts, uh, the FCC identified over 1,900 census blocks that would be eligible for the auction. Uh, and within those blocks, uh, it 
uh, determined uh, that they contain nearly 13,000 homes and businesses. So that would be the number of locations that are currently, uh, or at least as of December 31st, 2016, were currently unserved uh, that could become served as a result of this program. So if you want to think of that in terms of population, as of the um, 2010 census, there were uh, a little bit more than 23,000 Tennesseans living in those blocks. So those would be uh, people who uh, don't have access to service right now who could gain access to service as a result of the program. Uh, total budget, the FCC has uh, set a total uh, budget for the program at $2 billion uh, nationwide. That's going to be spread over 10 years, so around $200 million per year. Uh, and it has announced that the first round of bidding will uh, begin on July 24th of this year. So after that auction concludes and uh, uh, winners are announced, those winners will have six years to build out coverage to reach all of the locations in their winning bids. Um, How does the bidding process work? So it's the providers who are, are bidding? So it's Comcast or AT&T? Correct. I believe it is. It's uh, the eligibility requirements. I'd have to probably go back to the FCC and, and make sure I can confirm exactly what yeah. those eligibility requirements are. But yes, it's open to, to all providers who are, I believe, considered eligible telecommunications companies under uh, federal law. Um, there's rules that I'd have to get into that I'm not prepared to right. <laughs> discuss better, in depth right now. Better than I not think out loud, <laughs> I suppose, but with the funding that the state's making available, it'd be nice to see some, if not coordination, or at least some communication. You'd, you'd like to think that the, the folks who are um, competing for additional state funding are also participating in this mm -hmm. Eligibility. I don't know, mm -hmm. but yeah. yeah, it's something we could certainly look into. I think for for fu either future updates or for the follow up report to try to determine uh, which which providers are winning bids and 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 also from the state grow pro state grant program. Representative Wardo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I didn't mean to interject, but I heard you ask a question, so I'll, I'll do a follow up that I had. I was making a note here to ask it at the end, but I heard you say six years to do the build out. Is that six years to start it or is it have to, or does it have to be completed it within the six years? My understanding is that it will have to be completed within six years. So providers will have to certify that they are providing service to at least 95% of the locations that within they, their winning bid. Which they had, that they had applied for. Correct. Because I, I noticed, and you can notice by your map here, we have one gaping hole in the district where I am with Stewart County. And I don't think they received any of the bids, but I know that there will be another process going out. But I wanted, that was the, one of the questions was, can, if it's a year-long project, that means they can take up to five years to start it and then complete it in that year period. So uh, there, yeah, and there are certain uh, other rules around that. So I think, and this is where it gets a little technical. Um, so I apologize. It's okay. <laughs> uh, um, providers have six years to complete, as I said, 95% of their locations. That is judged statewide. So if a provider has multiple winning bids uh, within a state like Tennessee, uh, within three years, uh, they're required to have built out to 40% of those locations that they've won, uh, and then I think it's 20% thereafter until they've reached Okay, so the, the six amount. years is to be to, to be at that magic 95%. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Chairman, sir. for allowing me. Thank you. Go ahead, Matt. Um, okay, so uh, now I'll, I'll transition uh, to the Tennessee Broadband Accessibility Act, or Accessibility Grant Program, which, uh, of course, was uh, created through the Tennessee Broadband Accessibility Act in 2017. Uh, this, again, is... Um, a uh, program designed to offer uh, funding to providers to uh, offset the cost of uh, expanding coverage in unserved areas. It uses a uh, competitive application process um, as recommended um, or um, consistent with the recommendations in the commission's report. So on January 26, 2018, the Department of Economic and Community Development announced uh, the uh, recipients for the first round of grants. Uh, there were nine projects that were awarded funding, and you can see uh, a map of those areas, or the, the locations of those projects, that's the second map uh, behind tab two. I think if you flip over the FCC auction map, you'll see the map uh, created by ECD to show where those locations, or where the winners are. Um, those awards will result in coverage being ex expanded to at least 5,200 locations in the state. 
and they are located in 13 counties across the state. In total, uh, grants awarded in this cycle were more than $9.8 million. Uh, and looking ahead to the second round of grants, as the uh, chairman mentioned, of course, the General Assembly um, in the recently uh, passed budget for the state increased the amount of funding for the grant program by $5 million to a total of $15 million for the second round of grant applications. Those applications will become available for providers on July 17th of this year, and applications will be due October 11th. F uh, ECD anticipates announcing recipients for the second round of grants in February 2019. Yes, sir. Chairman Sargent. I, I just had one question. I'm, I'm trying to look at the two maps. Yes, sir. The first map is federal money providing $1.98 million, uh, billion dollars. And I look at Hancock County, and the southern part of Hancock County is red. Mm -hmm. I flip the map over, and the southern part of Hancock County is green. So the green is what the state is doing. Correct. The red is what the feds are possibly going to do. Is that that is, so yeah, so that is correct. Um, and actually, I was, I was just looking at that this morning, so thank you for that question. I think uh, that allows me to address it. There is certainly some overlap potentially between these maps, and that's because the FCC's eligibility, um, their, their determination of eligibility for the CAF auction was created based on coverage existing as of December 31st, 2016. So the grant that ECD has just announced uh, this year for that uh, portion of Hancock County would not have been considered by the FCC when determining uh, eligibility for that particular area. So there is certainly a possibility, and, and, and I'd have to discuss with, um, I, with the FCC about it. I mean, I know Hancock was one of the big ones, and Stewart uh, was one of the big ones. And then on the state chart, Stewart's not even, there's no dot there whatsoever. Right. And so these, uh, the, the areas on the state chart, I should, I should clarify, these are areas that have been awarded grants, uh, not areas that would necessarily be eligible for grants through the state's grant program. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, I would just like to provide two quick additional updates on other programs. Uh, first, the Broadband Ready Communities Program. Uh, there are uh, 22 communities across the state that have been designated as broadband ready communities according to ECD. Uh, this designation is intended to signal providers that these communities have adopted a set of uh, permitting and zoning procedures uh, that can help streamline the deployment of broadband facilities um, and providing communities with the opportunity to apply for this type of designation was among the recommendations in the commission's 2017 broadband report that were ultimately adopted in the Tennessee Broadband Accessibility Act uh, and a list of those communities that have currently been designated as broadband ready communities uh, is now available on ECD's website and they do try to update that routinely. Um, the final update is for uh, the Broadband Adoption Working Group. We had discussed that, I believe, at our December meeting. Based on discussions of the working group, ECD has now released a web page uh, with links to a variety of resources, including informational reports and case studies uh, for communities to assist those communities uh, with planning uh, uh, for the meeting their broadband needs, uh, as well as with uh, developing programs for encouraging broadband adoption. Um, and again, several of the resources and programs that are highlighted within those links are uh, resources or, or at least case studies that were identified within the commission's report. Um, so that concludes my update, and I'm happy to take any additional questions. Questions for Dr. Owen? Good work as always. Thank you. Thank you. Carry on. Cliff, what's next? The, the other commission update, uh, Mr. Chairman, is uh, we, we made a change to the recommendation on the, the IDB pilot report that was approved by the commission in January. It's a, a minor technical change, and it's included in tab two. And this was the, after some discussions with the Comptroller's Office of, of Open Records Council. We wanted to make it uh, we wanted to clarify that the uh, state's Open Meeting Act, as it applies to IDBs, is, is open to interpretation, and we wanted to make sure that our recommendation was was technically correct. And then also we added some language to to um, to make that 
make that clearer. So the, the, the actual change to the recommendation is we added the word uh, specifically, and this is shown at the underlined in the, on, uh, the first page of tab two, and then we struck out at least some before public notice uh, requirements, and then we added uh, the language shown in the next two paragraphs on the second page, just clarifying that this, the Open Meetings Act, as it applies to IDBs, has, has been open to, to some interpretation and suggesting that it, it should be clarified as it is with, uh, with the TIF law, where even though arguably TIF hearings would also be subject to the Open Meeting Act, it does specifically say what those requirements are in, uh, in, that, in that particular act. So we added the, the language shown, uh, we replaced the language shown in the first paragraph with, um, which was, but unlike for TIF hearings, no public notice is currently required required for IDB meetings, and replaced it with the longer language. While it could be interpreted that IDBs are required to provide notice of their meeting under the Open Meeting Act, the requirements of that act do not specifically define adequate notice. In contrast, public notice for IDB hearings concerning TIF agreements are clearly defined in the TIF statute. And this is in the uh, in the front part of the report, and then we added the the underlying language in, in the next paragraph on page 40 of the report. And again, this was just to, to make sure that everyone was, was comfortable with the way we were interpreting the Open Meeting Act as it applied to IDBs. Representative Carter, didn't we address some of the, I think we clarified a little bit of this in your the legislation you drafted and I sponsored in the Senate, right? On the public uh, access yeah. for open meetings, yes, sir. Yes, we did. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. And then, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have uh, a, a couple quick staff updates. Uh, we recognized uh, and took the, all the, the pictures and presented the frames before the meeting, but we'd like to rec recognize uh, Deputy Executive Director Melissa Brown, who has attained uh, 20 years of service to the state of Tennessee. Melissa. Here, here. And then uh, Senior Research Associate Bob Morio has, uh, has completed five years of service to the state of Tennessee. Bob. Thank you both. And then I have one other thing that's not included in tab two, but um, if you could go ahead and hand, hand out the, the pyramid. We, I, I did want to um, brag on one of our employees real quick, and Melissa's going to cover this a little bit, uh, a little bit also in the achievements, but uh, senior research uh, associate Jennifer Berry, who's back at the office right now, uh, has, was recently asked by the Department of, of Human Resources to write an article for their quarterly leadership newsletter, which is called the Leadership Link. And the reason they asked her to do this was because they were so impressed with the training program that, that she did, the professional development program that she uh, developed for TAS or staff, uh, that they wanted to, her to share that, that program with other agencies, and particularly other s uh, small state agencies. What, what uh, Jennifer did was she took the state's learning pyramid and customized and adapted it to meet the very specific requirements of, of TASSER staff and then added to that, it's just one component of a training program that also includes participation in the state's professional development courses and also outside uh, study uh, opportunities for staff. But uh, so that will, that'll, it, that, um, Newsletter's not come out yet. I, I think it's due out next next week. But uh, she just uh, just bowled over the Department of Human Resources with her work on this program. You, you're receiving the the one page pyramid, which is kind of the summary. But this was a what a 50 page training program that that Jennifer put together. Um, just yeah, it was impressive. I talked with Dr. Leppard a little bit before the meeting, of course, and and there are a number of of initiatives similar to this that, that TASSER is, involves itself in or, or takes the initiative in, which, you know, we probably ought to write up sometime so that all the members could fully appreciate a lot of the things you're doing in leadership programs and the like. But it's, um, there, there's a lot of professional enrichment and a lot of, um, a lot of contribution back in the leadership arena, which, which I appreciate and, and we should share with everybody on the board here. Thank you for that. The, the TASSER Learning Pyramid. I wish I wish Senator Watson were here. He'll be here tomorrow, but this is this is right up his alley. So, thank you and good work. Speaking of good work, Melissa, after 20 years, you're on your tab three. You know, did you like how we recycled the frames today? Just to, yeah, for the presentations, we're so thrifty. Well, I think I'm going to have to wrestle Bob for uh, my frame back <laughs> when we leave. So. We'll see what happens out in the corridor after the thank meeting. You. Can thank everybody hear much. me okay? 
Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, to continue on with uh, what Dr. Lippard was saying about our training program, I'll just cover under accomplishments, which is under tab three, what I was going to say about that. It really was an extensive undertaking uh, by Jennifer. She worked with TASSER staff to put this training together, and it includes three separate units. Uh, it's the learning pyramid, uh, as Dr. Lippert said, and as you have a copy of, certificates and degrees, and the State of Tennessee Leadership Program. Um, and she really did a lot of work over several months to put this together. And, and I'm glad uh, Cliff brought up that uh, Jennifer's going to be featured in the publication link. But our director is also a little modest. He, too, is going to be featured. Um, in that publication about his leadership style and what he values in his employees. So we appreciate him for his leadership as well. I, I value them not sharing things like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I am up here to discuss the accomplishments uh, found in uh, tab three of your docket book. This is going to take a few minutes. The commission has been very busy over the past year. So if you'll turn to tab three. Now, this is for information purposes only. It covers the 2017-18 fiscal year. So this is for information purposes only. There's no formal action required by the commission. This information will be re uh, included in the biennial report, which you will receive uh, later this summer. Uh, Nathan Shaver's working on that uh, for you. Has it, has it in draft form now. So beginning on page one of the memo, first, Six official commission reports were published over the past year. Now, two of these, bullet number three, the Tennessee Valley Payment in Lieu of Taxes Annual Report, and bullet item number six, Building Tennessee's Tomorrow, uh, the, our infrastructure report, those are required by statute and are recurring reports. The other four I'd like to go into in a little more detail uh, on the following pages of the memo. First are studies referred by the General Assembly. The first of these I want to discuss is Tennessee's 911 system. And like I said, this will take just a minute because we had a number of recommendations that you made in this report. This report responded to Public Chapter 795, Acts of 2014, which replaced the 911 funding system that relied on a combination of both state and local fees to fund 911 services with a flat statewide fee of $1.16 on all types of telecommunication services that connect to 911. And it also established a new method of distributing these funds. The act also directed the commission to study nine specific questions that addressed consolidation. The Tennessee Emergency Communications Board, also known as the TECB for the rest of this presentation, uh, its membership, telecommunication service providers registration and service interruption reporting requirements, and there were a few questions related to funding. In the report, you recommended that the TECB should continue its education efforts on the potential benefits of emergency communication districts, known as ECDs, and public safety answering points, known as PSAPs, their consolidation, and continue to encourage ECD consolidation when the local jurisdiction found that it made sense through the reimbursement of any associated cost. Next, you noted that there was no consensus recommendation on changes to the board membership, and that's the TECB board. You said that state law already requires telecommunication service providers to register with the state, <clears throat> with the state so there's no additional registration requirement is just really not necessary. You recommended that because the TECB would be better able to assist ECDs when there's a service interruption, if they knew about them sooner, Telecommunication service providers should be required to notify the TECB when there are service disruptions. You noted that there's no compelling argument to replace the current flat fee on telecommunication services with another structure. And you said it does not appear that the fee amount should be reduced. You also recommended that the TECB could tie the distribution of any additional revenue generated by rate increases to a standard set of cost components. And this distribution method would apply only to excess revenue above the base amount generated by any rate increases. Going to the top of page three in the memo, continuing on with recommendations, you said there was no consensus that the TECB should have authority to raise rates without state legislative approval. And you found that because the next generation 911 had not been fully implemented yet in Tennessee, that it was unclear whether statewide implementation had significantly affected the expenses of ECDs. Next, you completed a report on pilot payments, <clears throat> pilot agreements, which was directed by public cha chapter 431, 
Acts of 2017. Now this act directed the commission to study the economic benefits to counties and municipalities uh, from the use of pilot agreements and leases by industrial development corporations organized by municipalities, examine whether, whether there were economic benefits derived from limiting the length of term of a pilot agreement or lease to five or less years absent county approval or an agreement by the corporation or municipality to pay each year after the initial five years to the county a sum equal to the amount of real property tax that would have been assessed to a property if the agreement or lease had not been executed and study any additional issues you seemed uh, deemed relevant. You recommended that the state should encourage local governments to pursue one of the following cooperative approaches before entering into ad valorem pilot agreements with private businesses. Now there are some existing approaches that we noted that are already available in, in state law, and these include forming a joint IDB with representation of all separate taxing jurisdictions within the county to include special school districts which do have taxing authority, or uh, encouraging uh, taxing authorities to enter into interlocal agreements to establish criteria for any pilots that might affect shared tax bases, or receiving written approval from the city or county mayor, the city or county legislative body, and local special school districts before approval of pilot agreements. In the report, you noted that when entering into pilot agreements for retail development, local governments should be required to take one of these three cooperative approaches for agreements longer than 10 years. Either they or their IDB should be required to make annual payments after the initial 10 years to the other affected local governments equal to the amount of property taxes those governments would otherwise receive for the affected property based on its assessed value. You noted to improve transparency in the pilot process without undermining the confidentiality needed to negotiate agreements. IDB should specifically be required to provide public notice prior to their meetings, similar to what is already required for TIF hearings. Notice requirements should allow IDB's flexibility regarding the information provided and the time between posting and when a meeting is held to ensure that they remain workable with business recruitment processes that are highly competitive. You also recommended that lessees with pilot agreements should be required to include information about total investments made, number of jobs created, and taxes abated in their annual pilot report to the controller of the treasury. To allow for greater accountability and transparency, the uh, controller's office has recently compiled a master list of all agreements and in the future plans to send a copy of the annual reports they receive from each company to the local property assessor's office from that county so that they can compare their reports. Finally, you recommended that the TASR's fiscal capacity calculation should be updated to include current IDB assessment amounts rather than the 1993-95 pilot payments data currently used. Now this would require a change in state law or a recommendation by the Basic Education Program Review Committee and approval by the General Assembly. Now to get more to this point, Michael Mount is going to be covering uh, the fiscal capacity model for the current year and we've run some scenarios of what it would look like in fiscal capacity to make these changes. So that'll be behind tab six, that discussion. Next, you completed a report about the implementation of a boat titling system in Tennessee. This responded to public chapter 179, acts of 2017. In the report, you recommended that Tennessee should implement a boat titling system for motorized and sail powered boats that are either larger or likely to be more powerful. Tennessee could consider limiting titling both to boats that have a permanently attached engine and to boats that are at least 20 feet long, excluding any human powered watercraft. To avoid the uh, administrative burdens that would occur if titling agreements were applied retroactively to all existing boats, Tennessee could consider phasing in the new titling system by limiting it to boats manufactured at least one year after the law's effective date or to boats sold or transferred at least one year after the law's effective date. You noted that because of the lack of consensus regarding how a potential boat titling system should be administered, in Tennessee, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, county clerks, and the Department of Revenue should work together to determine an effective and agreed upon way to administer boat titling in the state. The group was asked to report back to the commission in December of 2018. And Nathan Shaver, who was the lead researcher on that report, has stayed in contact with the three groups and they continue discussions. 
Finally, you also said that Tennessee should provide consumers with greater protection from frauds perpetrated by unscrupulous boat dealers and prevent those individuals from becoming dealers by requiring them to meet minimum licensing requirements similar to motor vehicle and RV dealers, including background checks and surety bonds. Next, there was one report that was requested by the commission, and this was to revisit uh, your report from 2007 Beyond Capacity, Issues and Challenges Facing County Jails. And this is on page five of the memo. Staff was asked to determine whether the state, by housing convicted state prisoners in county jails for extended periods as part of the effort to reduce overcrowding in state prisons, had placed an undue burden on county governments. You noted that although the state had increased its reimbursement rate from $37 to $39 per prisoner per day on July 1st, 2017, that local officials were still concerned that the amount was, amount was inadequate. According to information received from the Department of Corrections staff, the average cost for counties to house state prisoners is between $43 and $45 per prisoner per day. The report recommended that to improve access to the behavioral health services already provided by the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services Criminal Justice Liaison Program, the state should provide funding to expand the program statewide. You recommended that in addition to existing initiatives, if the state's policy is to continue to rely on county jails to house large numbers of state prisoners, it should establish an incentive program to encourage counties to add needed services rather than simply relying on increases to the per diem amount. Funding assistance beyond the daily reimbursement rate could be offered to help counties implement programs proven to reduce recidivism and improve outcomes for prisoners and communities. The report noted that to clarify the framework for the oversight of county jails, state law should be amended to give the Tennessee Corrections Institute clear legal authority to require local correctional facilities to comply with set standards, including authority for the Board of Control to recommend that the Tennessee Department of Correction remove state prisoners from non-certified jails when the conditions warrant. Next, and we are at the beginning of uh, top of page six, there was one staff project that was published. So staff with input from the County Technical Assistance Service and the Municipal Technical Advisory Service updated the growth policy annexation and incorporation under PC 1101 of 1998 guide. And this was updated to ref reflect the significant changes to the state's growth planning and annexation laws caused by the passage of public chapter 707 acts of 2014. As part of the effort to update that guide, staff also updated the growth policy section of the TASSER website to reflect those changes and updates. Over the past year, staff provided two presentations. Both of these were by Dr. Lippard. The first was to Governing Magazine Summit on Financial Leadership. The title of the presentation was Federalism Through the Lens of Finance, Dynamics Between Cities, States, and the Federal Government. He also presented to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's annual Tennessee Directors Meeting. This was entitled TASSER and the Tennessee Joint Economic Community Development Boards. Over the past year, staff has participated in two panel discussions. The first, Dr. Owen spoke at an event series for the Cheatham County Democratic Party. It was part of their organization, presentation, evaluation, and navigation event series, and the panel was entitled Broadband Internet Expansion. Dr. Lippard participated with the American Society of Public Administration's National Conference in a panel titled The Shifting Dynamics of State and Local Relations. Over the past year, staff has worked with uh, some task forces in state government. Dr. Owen continues his work with the Broadband Adoption Working Group as part of the Tennessee Economic and Community Development's Rural Task Force. The governor has also established Tennessee's H2O Task Force. Jennifer Berry, Senior Research Associate, and Lanise Patrick, Senior Policy Consultant, are working with uh, some of the technical working groups and the legal framework working group as part of the overall work of the task force. And Jennifer is also serving as a li liaison between the technical working group and the infrastructure working group. Over the past year, all staff responded to various requests for information and assistance from members of the General Assembly and legislative committees, from local governments, state agencies, lobbyists, the public, and the media. 
Over the past year, we administered 10 contracts. Nine of these were to support the public infrastructure needs inventory. They were with the development districts who continue to do a wonderful job uh, providing us information for the infrastructure report. The other contract was with Middle Tennessee State University as part of the Economic Indicators website tracking Tennessee's economy. In the middle of page seven, you'll see a heading, Accomplishments by Policy Area. It's all the information I've just covered, except it's divided by policy area, whether it was fiscal research, education, finance, et cetera. Turning to page eight, toward the bottom, you'll see a, a heading, Using Technology for Public Information. We've continued to disseminate all of our reports electronically and maintain detailed focus sections about continuing research on TASER's website. We continue to disseminate information on the infrastructure report through our partnership with the University of Tennessee to include our, include our data on the State Data Explorer website. Something new this year, we have begun adding GPS coordinates to projects reported in the infrastructure inventory uh, to better identify their exact location. We've continued to update and enhance our county profiles. Again, we uh, continue to update Tracking Tennessee's Economy, the website we work on in conjunction with MTSU. Another new item, we added a fiscal federalism information page for the TASER website. This was previewed for you by research manager Mark McAdoo last year. Another new section of our, research, of our uh, website is the Tennessee Valley Authority Payments in Lieu of Taxes pages for uh, TASER. Over the past year, we transitioned, transitioned to the state's new website. This was done in December 2007. And Mark Patterson, our IT manager, and Teresa Gibson, our web development manager and publications developer, they've increased the functionality of our website with the addition of Tableau maps, data tables for fiscal capacity, infrastructure, and county profiles. Ms. Brown, are we tracking the the usage of our website? I'd yes. Be, I'd be curious. Yes, we do. And so. I can have Teresa pull those numbers. She actually pulled them for me about three weeks ago, so I'd like to give you some updated numbers tomorrow if okay, that's okay. Okay, that would be useful. Thank you. It's just a, a wealth of information online, and I want to make sure we're effectively communicating its and I believe, availability. Teresa, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you can do that by section of the website. Is that right? In December. Okay. All right, maybe we can talk about that a little bit tomorrow. Okay. That'd be great. Questions for Ms. Brown? It's a lot of work. All right. All thank done you. within existing resources, right? Yes, yeah? absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, moving right along to tab four. Nathan is here. The, the legislative update. This is uh, for those of us going through legislative withdrawal. I don't know. This could be sort of a shock to our systems, right? but we'll, we'll endure. <laughs> Tab four. There we go. There you are. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'll, I'll now be presenting the commission's legislative update for the uh, 2018 General, General Assembly session that ended last week. Uh, it was another busy year in the Tennessee General Assembly. Uh, this session, there were a number of bills that were passed or considered that dealt with issues that have been studied by the commission over the last few years. So first I'll go over these bills and then I'll pivot to talk about the General Assembly's request for new TASR studies. Uh, these are coming from bills that were either passed by the General Assembly or were referred by legislative committees. Uh, Hang on just a minute, Nathan. Cliff? And I just want to interject. Uh, members feel free to ask questions as Nathan is going through this, but he's, he's as he goes through the, the the studies that were requested for us to do. Melissa is actually going to go over uh, the work program in the next tab, where, which will require your vote on which ones of those studies we actually are going to pursue. So it's kind of a, a, a yep. two-punch approach. Uh, so starting first with the issue of broadband internet, it was an issue addressed by the Commission's uh, January 2017 report, as you all remember. Uh, the General Assembly passed Public Chapter uh, 819, Acts of 2018. That was from uh, a Senate bill by Senator Ketron and House bill by Lamberth. And it's known as the Competitive Wireless Broadband Investment Deployment and Safety Act of 2018. And the act's intended purpose is to maximize investment in wireless connectivity across the state 
by creating a uniform and predictable framework that limits local obstacles to the deployment of small wireless facilities and to encourage shared use of public infrastructure in co-location in a manner that is the most technologically neutral and non-discriminatory. Uh, these small wireless facilities are developed for the establishment of uh, the next generation of wireless technology, which is known as 5G, uh, which was a topic that was touched upon in the 2017 report. And, and this new act also directs the Commission to study and prepare a report on the effect of the act due in 2021, which we'll discuss more later. Uh, two, other, two other bills addressing broadband internet failed to pass this, this session. Uh, Senate Bill 1045 by Bowling and House Bill 1410 by Weaver, uh, which would have uh, authorized municipal electric systems to provide broadband outside their electric service areas, uh, would have authorized electric cooperatives to provide broadband both inside and outside their electric service areas, and it would have uh, removed territorial restrictions on joint ventures, and it would have also allowed uh, municipal electric systems, electric cooperatives, to partner in joint ventures without third-party entities. And of the changes to state law proposed in this bill, the commission only recommended authorizing electric cooperatives to provide broadband inside their electric service area, which has already been enacted with public chapter 228 of 2017. And to the extent that the commission recommended authorizing municipal electric and electric cooperatives to partner in joint ventures, it recommended that municipal electrics not be authorized to use electric ratepayer revenue to provide broadband outside its electric uh, service area. And this bill was introduced in 2017 and failed in the Senate and House subcommittees in 2018. And the second bill, uh, second broadband bill that did not pass was Senate Bill 1058 by Bowling and House Bill 970 by Howell, uh, which would have authorized municipal electric systems to provide cable service, two-way video transmission, uh, video programming, and internet services outside its service area. And the Commission's report discusses authorizing municipal electric systems to provide broadband outside their electric service areas, but did not include this among its recommendation. And this bill was taken off notice in the Senate and House subcommittees in 2018. So next, turning to the issue of annexation, um, the General Assembly considered two bills related to topics addressed in the Commission's 2013 and 2015 uh, annexation reports, uh, one that passed and one that did not. Uh, the first bill, Senate Bill 2680 by Bailey and House Bill 2125 by Williams, uh, which was passed by the General Assembly, reduces the number of owners required to consent to annexation without a referendum from all of the affected owners to a two-thirds majority of the property owners who own a majority of the territory proposed for annexation. Uh, this topic was discussed in the Commission's January 2015 report in noting that unlike the referendum process, which requires only a simple majority to approve annexation, a petition process could be structured to require a higher threshold, affording more protection to those opposed to annexation if the legislature so chose. In this bill, uh, provides that a referendum is not required to effectuate annexation of a territory if the proposed annexation consists of nine or fewer parcels, uh, two-thirds of the property owners within the territory proposed for annexation, consent in writing, and the total area of the property owned by the individuals petitioning for the annexation is more than one-half of the territory proposed for annexation and repeals the provision in January of 2023. And the second bill on annexation is Senate Bill uh, 640, 641 by Watson and House Bill 943 by Carter, uh, which addressed uh, de-annexation of an area annexed by a municipality, which was a topic discussed in the Commission's January 2015 and December uh, 2013 reports. So in the, in the 2013 report, the Commission recommended uh, Further consideration of giving property owners a right to initiate de-annexation, provided that it does not create non-contiguity non or unincorporated islands, and the city is compensated for its investment in municipal infrastructure other than those associated with rate-paid services. And this bill, as filed, would have, permitted vote, would have permitted voters residing within an area annexed by a municipality to petition the County Election Commission to hold an election to de-annex such territories and would have specified that taxes may continue to be levied on a de-annexed de area and would have prohibited the discontinuation of utility services outside municipal boundaries for reasons related to de-annexation. Uh, the Senate version, which, which passed and had several amendments, including those requiring 
the referendum for de-annexation be held citywide uh, and that cities that have already begun developing a de-annexation plan of their own be exempted. Uh, and the House version was sent to the local government subcommittee uh, and was taken off notice in March of 2018. So turning to the next issue of payments in lieu of tax agreements, which was a issue that the commission discussed a lot last year. Um, from the commission's uh, report that was released in January of 2018, encouraging more cooperation and accountability in payments in lieu of tax agreements. And Senate Bill 2622 by Norris and House Bill 2664 by Carter, which passed and is based on the commission's recommendations, helps to alleviate the problem of one local government abating the property taxes of another local government for long durations without agreements, uh, which had recently occurred, uh, as we've discussed in the commission in Sevier County, when Pigeon Forge's Industrial Development Board's pilot agreement with the public's grocery store abated not only the business's city property taxes, but also its own county, county property taxes for a 20-year period. And this bill helps to alleviate this precise issue by authorizing uh, industrial development Corporation to negotiate a payment in lieu of tax agreement for less than the ad valorem taxes otherwise due for a retail business for a period longer than 10 years, uh, in addition to a reasonable construction and installation period of not more than three years if one of the following conditions are, is met. Uh, one, the corporation is a joint industrial development corporation with representation of all uh, separate taxing jurisdictions within the county. And two, the corporation has entered into an interlocal agreement uh, with the other taxing jurisdictions. And three, the corporation has received written approval from each affected local government entity. Or number four, the corporation pays the other affected local governments the amount of ad valorem taxes those governments would otherwise receive for the affected property based on its assessment, assessed value over the initial 10 years of the agreement. And note that Shelby County is uh, specifically excluded from this bill. But you need to tell them why, of course, because we already have that. Which, which Shelby County has already had the agreements in place to prevent those issues, so it didn't need the bill. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, additionally, consistent with the 2008 or 2018 report, the bill also requires industrial development corporations to hold a public meeting relating to the proposed agreement after notice is provided by the corporation or governing body at least five days prior to the date of the public hearing. And moving to the next bill, the subject of uh, the commission's 2012 report uh, dealing with blight strategies for Tennessee's communities uh, was addressed by the, this issue was addressed by the Tennessee legislature in 2018 with two laws that passed and are consistent with the commission's recommendations. So Senate Bill 2347 by Gardenhire and House Bill 2350 by Brooks authorizes the city of Cleveland and Hardeman County to participate in the Tennessee Local Land Bank Program. Um, another program discussed in the 2012 Blight Report, the Neighborhood Preservation Act, uh, which allows any neighbor or interested party to sue the owner of a property not maintained to community standards and originally applied to Davidson, Shelby, and later Madison counties. Uh, public Chapter 779 Acts of 2018, which was by Senator Jackson and Representative White, uh, is consistent with the commission's recommendation and extends the application of the Neighborhood Preservation Act to include any county or municipality that has formed a land bank and also makes several changes to the act to improve and expedite the legal process. So moving to the next uh, topic, uh, Tennessee's court fees and taxes, which was addressed in the commission's uh, 2017 report. Uh, was, was, it was the issue of Senate Bill 1084 by Lundberg and House Bill 880 by Daniel. Uh, this failed to pass this year. Uh, this bill was consistent with, the, with a recommendation in the commission's port report, which would have created a court fee and advisory council that would make recommendations concerning pending legislation proposing any new litigation tax or fee on civil or criminal cases to the members of the General Assembly. Uh, the bill failed to advance past the Senate Judiciary Committee and was taken off notice in the House Finance Ways and Means Subcommittee. So moving to the next issue, um, the General Assembly considered two bills that did not pass that were consistent with recommendations 
in the Commission's 2007 report, uh, Trust But Verify, incre Increasing Voter Confidence in Election Results, uh, Senate Bill 2090 by Yarbrough and House Bill uh, 2300 by Alexander, would have required each voting precinct using direct recording electronic voting systems to have the capability to create a voter verifiable paper audit trail for each ballot cast. Um, in Senate Bill 2438 by Yarbrough, in-house bill uh, 2567 by Stewart would have required each county election commission to utilize precinct-based optical scanners. And finally, the issue of professional privilege taxes uh, was once again discussed. Um, this issue uh, was covered by the commission's December 2016 report, uh, Professional Privilege Tax in Tennessee, Taxing Professionals Fairly. And it was the subject of three bills discussed in the second session of the 110th General Assembly, all of which failed to pass. Uh, there's Senate Bill 205 by Bowling and House Bill 1034 by Van Huss, uh, which would have eliminated the professional privilege tax for the, for the tax year ending on May 31st of 2018 and subsequent tax years. Senate Bill 132 by Bowling and House Bill, 40, House Bill 41 by Van Huss would have phased out the professional privilege tax over a five-year period. Uh, the, the task report did study alternatives for eliminating or phasing out the professional privilege tax. In Senate Bill 306 by Cal and House Bill 46 by Clemens uh, would have exempted individuals from the professional privilege tax for the first year in which they are licensed or registered in a tax profession. And all three of these bills did not pass. So now to the second part of this presentation, and I'll discuss the General Assembly's 2018 requests for new TASR studies, and we had a fair amount this year. Um, the General Assembly this year passed seven pieces of legislation requiring new commission studies with varying due dates. And three additional studies were requested by committees and subcommittees of the legislature. So first I'll go over the seven studies that were directed uh, by, new, by new bills that passed, and then I'll discuss the three studies that were requested by the legislative committees. And after that, uh, Deputy, Executor, Decu, excuse me, Deputy Executive Director Melissa Brown will uh, present TASR's work program amendment for you to vote on, uh, along with the new studies research plans, uh, which will include additional background information about some of these studies. So as noted, there were seven pieces of legislation that were passed that required new TASR studies. Uh, the first study, uh, based on a bill, addresses non-tax producing properties. And it comes from Public Chapter 693, Acts of 2018, and this was a bill by Chairman Watson and Carter, um, it, which directs the commission to determine the amounts of non-tax producing property held by state and local governments in Tennessee and provide recommendations as to the highest and best use, uses of the properties and ways for making the properties productive. Uh, the bill requires the commission to report its findings and recommendations by March 1st of 2019. And the second study that comes from uh, legislation is, uh, is one that addresses small cell wireless facilities. And this is public chapter 819 acts of 2018, which I mentioned initially. And this is known as the Competitive Wireless Broadband Investment Deployment and Safety Act of 2018. And, which makes changes to, uh, to the laws governing the deployment of facilities for providing these wireless telecommun telecommunication and broadband internet services in Tennessee. And uh, the act also directs TASR to study and submit a report by January 2021 uh, on the following things. The, the act's effect on the deployment of broadband and the act's fiscal effect on local governments. Uh, best practices from both the perspective of stakeholders and from a review of other states. Uh, opportunities to advance other policy goals supported by the deployment of facilities for providing wireless broadband, specifically uh, opportunities to advance the quality of transportation in Tennessee uh, by utilizing uh, technological applications, sometimes referred to as smart transportation applications. And last, uh, rec recommendations for any changes to the law based on the findings of the commission study. In the Third bill that sent a study to TASR is one that addresses the criminal statutes of limitations. And this comes from Senate Bill 2538 by Ketron and House Bill 2536 by Sparks. 
uh, which was passed by the General Assembly and signed by the governor, but not yet chaptered. And it, and it directs the commission to study the effectiveness of Tennessee statutes, statutes of limitations on the prosecution of criminal offenses. And it must include, but not be limited to, information on the effectiveness of statutes of limitations on the prosecution of sexual offenses. And the act requires the commission to report its findings and recommendations, including any proposed legislation by January 15th of 2019. And in the fourth bill that uh, was sent to us uh, is a study that directs uh, GPS monitoring is a condition of bail for domestic violence offenders. Uh, this comes from Public Chapter 827, Acts of uh, 2018. Uh, this is from Senate Bill uh, by Cowell and House Bill by Hardaway. And it directs the commission to study the implementation and effects of GPS monitoring is a condition of bail for defendants accused of stalking aggravated stalking, especially aggravated stalking, domestic abuse, sexual assault, or violation of an order of protection. And the act requires the commission to report its findings and recommendations by January 1st of 2020. And the fifth bill requiring a study for TASSER is one on the creation of food desert relief enterprises funds. Great bill. Great. <laughs> this, uh, this comes from public chapter 795 acts of 2018 carried by our, our very own Chairman Norris and Representative Love, uh, directs the commission to study the potential overall effects of creating a grant and loan program administered by the Department of Economic and Community Development to encourage the financing and development of food desert relief enterprises that sell fresh food in low-income, underserved areas of the state. The act, requires the, re the act requires the study to include the benefits and costs of creating a special reserve fund in the state treasury to be known as the Fresh Food Financing Fund, uh, into which the revenue generated from a 0.0625% of the rate of tax imposed by the section of the code on retail sales of sugar-sweetened beverages is deposited for the sole use of funding grants and loans to encourage the financing and development of food desert relief enterprises also known as affordable healthy food retail stores. And the act requires the commission to submit its report by February 1st of 2019. And the sixth bill um, sent to task requiring a study is uh, one on credit to shippers, um, franchise and excise tax liability in Shelby County. This uh, comes, comes from Senate Bill 1277 by Chairman Norris and House Bill 1345 by Representative Camper. Uh, which was passed by the General Assembly and sent to the speakers for their signature, uh, and directs the commission to perform a study of the potential overall effects of creating a franchise and excise tax credit for shippers with pickups or deliveries originating in or destined to Shelby County. Uh, the bill establishes criteria to be considered by the co commission in conducting this study and requires the commission to submit a report disclosing the findings of the study and recommendations, including any proposed legislation uh, to the General Assembly by February 1st of uh, 2020. And the last bill from, um, from legislation this year was uh, the, a bill on multi-school system um, counties. And this comes by way of Senate Joint Resolution 593, which was uh, sponsored by uh, Senator Hale and Representative Brooks, uh, which was passed by the General Assembly and signed by the governor and it directs the commission to study the overall effects on public education of the laws and regulations related to the sharing of resources among school districts located in the same county in the operation within a county of municipal or special school districts in addition to the county school system. And there was no due date listed in the resolution. So now I'll, I'll move on to the studies requested by committees and subcommittees. Uh, we have three of those. Uh, the first was uh, one on the consolidation of municipal elections. Uh, this, this comes from House Bill 2265 by Sexton and Senate Bill 2146 by Gardenhire. Uh, is amended would require all municipal elections to coincide with the August or November general elections beginning in 2022. To match the terms of elected officials with the new election dates, the bill would have allowed municipalities to extend terms up to two years beyond their regular expiration dates. Um, during the House Local Government Subcommittee discussion on the bill, uh, Representative Wargo made a motion which passed to request the
commission study the bill. That's companion bill, Senate Bill 2146, uh, was deferred to summer study in the uh, Senate State and Local Government Committee, but the chair has indicated that they intend for the commission to conduct the study. And number, the second bill that comes from, um, that comes from uh, committees of the legislature is one on state shared taxes and local services. And this comes from House Bill 971 by Sargent and Senate Bill 1075 by Watson. It is amended the House Finance Subcommittee, or excuse me, is amended by the House Finance Subcommittee. It would have rev revised the distribution of local government revenue generation by the 2.25% local sales tax imposed on the sales price on the sales made in this state by dealers with no location in Tennessee. And during discussion of the bill in the House Finance Ways and Means Committee, uh, Representative Carter made a motion which passed to send the bill to the commission for study to address uh, the following four questions. Uh, what, what are the duties of the cities mandated, mandated by law? Uh, number two, what are the duties of counties mandated by law? Uh, number three, what funds go from the state to cities to comply with the law? Uh, number four, what funds go from the state to counties to comply with the law? And since that time, Chairman uh, Sargent of the House Finance Ways and Means Committee has provided Tasser a letter uh, regarding this study, which uh, Deputy Executive Director Melissa Brown will address when discussing the work program amendments, and I believe she'll be passing out a copy of the letter. And then we'll all pass out, right? Oh, re <laughs> yeah, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in your write-up under K, the second page, uh, review the uh, referred legislation. You have the, the Department of Education, Department of Revenue. You got County uh, uh, Tennessee Municipal League, which is a league that's made up basically of all your cities. Then you have the city and county mayors. I'd like to add in there that we have the executive director of the County Mayors Association to be added to that uh, because he'd be representing all the county mayors. I'm not saying mayors and city mayors may not, but Tennessee Municipal League is made up of your city mayors where I'd like to have the executive director of the County Mayors Association be on there because he has a direct knowledge. He's worked with me and everyone on the committee on trying to get this worked out. So, and then I, I, the other thing I noticed there was no timeline, <laughs> and I hate to put anything under a timeline, but I'd like to see some kind of preliminary report. When's our next meeting? It depends. <laughs> it's, prob it's in August. <laughs> I'm not sure of the date. And then after that? Well, my crystal ball goes dim. I, well, I, I was trying to push it out as long as possible that I was going to be here. That's all I was trying to do. <laughs> well, so, you know, we're going to meet again before so October 31st. Well, I'd push you, it out. Yeah, so there's August 28th and 29th, and the fall meeting is December 5th and December, 6th. December 3rd. I, I would like to have, and I know that we may be, I may be pushing you on that, but the, uh, the House and the Senate Finance Chair are both very interested in this, and my two members sitting on each side of me are interested in this. And for the simple reason, we feel... We want your knowledge and your input, but we feel a bill will be coming up, a follow-up bill on this will be coming up. So I know they'd like to file it in January, February, uh, as far as that's concerned. So, you know, whatever we can do, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, yes, sir, absolutely. So um, we'll take that up. We'll take that up behind tab five. Okay. Duly noted. Thank you. I thought we was on tab five. And the... You're just anticipating tab five, because because tab four has been so riveting. You're doing yeah. a great job. Yeah. There. You're doing Thank the you. best you can with what you've got. It's exciting. But wrap it up, would you? Well, I'm on the last bill now. And I, I know. Can, I know. Unfortunately, Be merciful and finish. So the, this the last bill that was uh, sent to us by a uh, by committee of the legislature is a tobacco master settlement agreement. And this is one based on cigarette sales. Is actually a kind of a highly technical, complicated bill that I have some background information on that, if you'll bear with me, I'll, it sets up the bill to, so that uh, it's a little bit more helpful. Uh, so the, the final study we received from the Legislative Committee is uh, one on the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement, and 
And before I jump into it, I'll provide a bit of background information uh, to give some context. So back in 1998, uh, Tennessee, along with 46 other states, entered into a historic multi-state settlement known as the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement with the major tobacco companies. And as a result of the Master Settlement Agreement, Tennessee received yearly payments from the tobacco companies uh, that uh, uh, participated in the settlement based on the number of cigarette sales nationwide. Um, in 2016, Tennessee, Tennessee received $139 million from this. And to, to date, uh, Tennessee's general fund has received over $2.8 billion in master settlement payments from the tobacco companies. However, there are some smaller tobacco companies that are not participants in the master settlement agreement. And these tobacco companies are referred to as the non-participating manufacturers. Uh, the yearly payment obligation does not apply to these non-participating manufacturers as non-signatories to this master settlement agreement. Uh, giving the non-participating man manufacturers a cost advantage. So in an effort to equalize the effect on the participating manufacturers, the master settlement agreement contains a provision requiring each settling state, such as Tennessee, to enact a statute to collect escrow payments from the non-participating smaller tobacco manufacturers, thereby imposing similar financial obligations on these non-participating manufacturers. It is required by the Master Settlement Agreement in 1999, uh, the Tennessee General Assembly passed the Tobacco, uh, tobacco Manufacturers Escrow Fund Act. Uh, and in general, the Escrow Fund Act requires that non-participating manufacturers whose cigarettes are sold to consumers in Tennessee to make yearly escrow deposits based on the number of cigarettes that the non-participating manufacturers sold to consumers within the state of Tennessee. And the Department of Revenue maintains a directory of all tobacco product manufacturers, along with their brand families that are in compliance with the directory statute and are allowed to sell cigarettes in Tennessee. And this directory is updated as necessary to add or remove uh, tobacco product manufacturers or brand families, and each non-participating manufacturer must also certify to the Attorney General that the proper payment has been made, and uh, failure to comply with these regulations may result in the non-participating manufacturer being removed from the state's directory and other actions being taken against that company. Uh, the master settlement agree agreement requires the selling states such as Tennessee to diligently enforce that escrow statute and pursuant to the master settlement agreement that the participating manufacturers which are the larger tobacco companies can contest whether a state has diligently enforced its escrow statute in the collection of, of escrow from the non-participating smaller uh, tobacco manufacturers for a particular year. And based on the outcome of arbitration, this could lead to a reduction in the payment amount from the participating manufacturers, which I mentioned earlier was 139 million last year. Uh, so now to the bill uh, that Tasser uh, study is requested based on, this is uh, Senate Bill 1989 by Stevens and House Bill 2154 by Hawk. It's drafted would have reduced the number of reasons for which a non-participating manufacturer would be excluded from the tobacco product manufacturing directory that I mentioned earlier for a failure to pay an escrow payment governed by the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement. And the fiscal note on the bill um, shows that according to the Department of Revenue, this legislation uh, will affect the department's ability to enforce both the tobacco product manufacturing directory statute and the escrow statutes that are required by the Master Settlement Agreement. Uh, and additionally, the fiscal note shows that according to the Department of Revenue, a uh, failure to enforce these requirements could subject Tennessee to a non-participating manufacturer rate adjustment. And as a result, a recalculation of settlement payments by participating members due to their loss of market share to these non-participating manufacturers or smaller tobacco companies. Uh, and the amount of a potential non-participating manufacturer adjustment is subject to arbitration and cannot be reasonably estimated according to the fiscal note. However, any such adjust uh, estimated, or excuse me, any such adjustment is estimated to result in a significant loss in, in state revenue according to the fiscal note. So, with that in mind, the bill came to the commission when Representative Hawk, uh, who's the bill sponsor, made a motion which passed in the House Finance Ways and Means Committee to send the bill to the commission for additional study with a requested due date of 2020. And the, Senate's, and the Senate Finance Ways and Means Committee later amended the bill to provide guidelines for the commission's study. 
And the Senate amendment uh, specifies that the commission shall perform a study of the Department of Revenue's use of Tennessee's directory statute to exclude or remove an escrow compliant non-participating manufacturer or brand family owned by that non-participating manufacturer from the directory of approved tobacco product manufacturers in Tennessee. Uh, it's, it's complicated, I know. And to determine the necessity for any such enforcement action by the Department of Revenue under either under the provisions of the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement or for the purpose of limiting an adverse impact to state revenues, if any. And the amendment, which was passed by the Senate Finance Ways and Means Committee but remains in the Senate Calendar Committee and did not pass the full Senate, it lists a due date of March 1st of 2019. Chairman Sargent. Thank you. Is there, a, Chairman, thank you. Uh, you may also know the answer. Is there a date that the master tobacco settlement runs out? Is it going to last 25 years or 30 years? Do we know? I looked at that earlier in the, in the payments that we receive. It's supposed to, they're supposed to last forever, but I. Forever? They're supposed to. It's, but okay. I, I, I really haven't researched this enough to know if that's a reality or not. The only reason I'm asking, because if, if not, we're going to have to be aware if, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, because I mean, that's going to make a, a big dent in the budget. Uh, actually, it's gone up. This year's collections were about $25 million higher than they were the year before, which is, I, I know, unusual, but it, uh, but it did happen that way this year. So, I, you know, if, if it's forever, I'm not going to worry about it. If it's five or six years, I think we have to start figuring how we're going to do away with this amount of money in our budget. Thank you. Absolutely. I wonder who's going to draw the short straw on that assignment, <laughs> Cliff. I th it looks like Nathan's done significant <laughs> research on it already. Yeah. So. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, so pending any further questions, uh, the Deputy Director, Melissa Brown, will uh, present the work program amendment, and you can yep. vote Thank on you, Nathan. Bills. Let's move into that. Well, everything you've said is still freshly There's a lot, I know. I apologize. No, you did fine. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Ms. Tab Brown, five. welcome back. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So taking a look at tab five, the work program amendment and the research plans. As you can tell by Nathan's presentation, there's a large number of projects coming our way this year. So first, I'd like to give you an idea of how this tab is set up. First is the memo, which we'll go through in just a moment. These tabs lettered A through K represent draft research plans for each of the projects that has been sent to us so far. The research plan, hopefully that format looks very familiar to you. It is our eight-step process that we use for all of our research. If you have any questions about any of that, please let me know. Behind each research plan, at the very back of each research plan, is a timeline for completion of the project. And then behind that is, <clears throat> excuse me, is a copy of the legislation directing the study or the item to be studied if it was referred by committee. So looking back at page one of the memo, first I'd like to give you the status of existing work program projects. The annual public infrastructure needs report, you approved this at our January meeting. Staff has continued to gather and review data for next year's report, which you should hear in January. The TVA annual pilot report, again, you approved this year's report in January. We will update you in January of 2019 to meet the legislature's reporting deadline of February 28th, 2019. The fiscal capacity index. We have submitted this year's index to the Department of Education and the State Board of Education for use in calculating the basic education program funding formula for next school year. Michael Mount's going to be giving you an update on this year's model behind tab six when we get to that. The next index will be due to the department by May 1st, 2019. At the January meeting, a project was added related to cord cutting and local government revenue. We have tentatively scheduled 
a draft of that report to be prepared by May 2019 and a final report at our fall 2019 meeting. Now, a copy of the research plan for cord cutting can be found behind tab eight, but you have not seen that yet. And then finally, Public Chapter 228, Acts of 2017, is the act that directs an update of our broadband report by January of 2021. So now we're to the amendments to the work program. So the way this is set up, the first amendment, this adds the seven studies that were directed by legislation passed by the 110th General Assembly. And to Nathan's presentation, I'll just say ditto what he said about all these bills that are coming yep, our way. Great. I certainly don't want to give the presentation on the tobacco issue no. if I don't have to. <laughs> so I, I appreciate Nathan uh, taking up that chore. I do want to tell you how these are organized. These are under Amendment 1 listed by the earliest due date required. So there's seven. The last one listed is the Senate Joint Resolution related to the study of uh, the sharing of revenue. There's no date specified. I will tell you that for internal purposes, we have a draft research plan where we have tentatively scheduled August 2019 as a draft and December 2019 for a final for that report. Of course, that can change based on what you decide to adopt today. So that's is Amendment that, 1 are the seven that studies. Shared? Wait a minute. Oh, multi-system. Multi-school okay. system. I apologize. That's yeah. okay. Yeah, Cliff. Just real quick, members, uh, you've received a, a handout, and this is just an internal kind of planning document we've we've uh, been using as we've been trying to figure out how to space these out over the next couple of years based on their their due dates and on and on our uh, capacity to get them done. So this is just for planning purposes, but we wanted to provide you some visualization of where we'd be assuming that all the uh, reports sent to us were adopted by the commission to be pursued. Okay. So amendment one is the uh, action before us, and, and that includes the seven that were sent by both houses. By yes. both houses, which yes, is sir. our is our primary. Um, it, it, it's the it's the way we like to receive assignments. Several you remember several years ago, we started to try and give a little more structure to this, so that folks weren't just willy nilly sending. Um, things to us as though we were summer study. Um, is there discussion about about the seven items duly referred, Chairman Wargo? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I and I appreciate the work of this committee and listening and put some in some some of these uh, requests. I would be willing to make a sacrifice on the election, and I bet I could get Senator Yeager to agree with me on the elections. For the for uh, holding the uh, some of those elections for the mayor races to coincide with August or November, I believe if we got a report and if we did legislation, it would probably still be too late to be effective for 2019. And if they wanted to bump up that uh, state share taxes, which I think is more on folks' mind with legislation as opposed to that election process, I think we could postpone ours. Uh, I believe you're, it's I, tab I, uh, I see, but I do see that you have it in for this year. Right. Okay. But we, I, I would think that we would be willing to forego that uh, study for push it back into 2019 because I don't think we could get anything done legislatively wise to affect the 2019 anyways. And yeah. we're not looking for an effective date until 2022. So maybe that would help you. Uh, just so I think what just, we have with the way this is mapped out is we have that behind amendment two to consider next. And what's before us right now is amendment one on the first seven. Gotcha. Yeah. You're right. Right. Yeah, these I was I was jumping just a little That's bit good. ahead no, of you, that, and that, I apologize. That gets us primed so we can so, anticipate. Well, if there are any, you won't make any... me repeat that, will you? Uh, no, sir. No, we've got it committed, Mayor Center. Yes, do you have a question? So, so Amendment One actually covers the seven bills that are sent to us by public chapter or or soon to be chapter. These are all ones that have, have passed and been signed by the governor. Uh, okay. So this this would be uh, tabs A through. Court cutting is actually tab A, so oh, getting right. under this amendment, it begins with tab B so to B, represent these studies. Yeah, B so, through H. Right, right. 
would this this would be the work programs under B through H. So, so these are the again the seven seven bills that have have actually passed the General Assembly. Other questions? Next meeting we'll have decoder rings for everyone. <laughs> so All right. So the chair will entertain a motion that we adopt Amendment One. So Senator Yarborough moved. moves Amendment One. Second. Second by Chairman Worko. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? It's approved. Thank you. All right. Amendment two. All right. Yes. Amendment two. So now we're to the elections. I'll just say there's no I in team, so how's that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cliff, comments on Amendment 2? Which also includes the tobacco. It's, it's two bills under two. Do you want to, Melissa, do you want to go ahead and... So, uh, the, way, <laughs> the way we've organized this, so these are the, these are the two bills that were that uh, have been requested by both, the, by both chambers of the General Assembly. They haven't actually passed both chambers right. of the General Assembly. Uh, and of these, the, the first is the, the, election, uh, the election study that uh, Chairman Wurgo was just discussing. This actually doesn't have a due date uh, specified, so we have some flexibility even if we adopt the study as far as shifting it in order to take up the, if we wanted to, you know, hold those resources for now and, and focus them on on uh, the uh, the state shared tax uh, study instead, which is under Amendment Three, Chairman Wardle. Yeah, I was just I was looking at your plan here. I had seen that you had put a final in fall of eighteen, unless I'm reading the draft wrong on this table. That was that was handed out. For, for elections, we had August 2018 as a draft and December 18 as a final. And yeah. this is probably a little too too much inside baseball, but it's partly a, a, a staffing. Some of the people that were working on that study were also going to work on a later study, so we're just getting that out of the way so that, that that's what I was. Th study, yeah, that's so what I was. Can, yeah, that's what I was basing it off of. That's right. all. So thank you, sir. Uh, you guys do a great job. I'll let you handle that. But I was just throwing that out there as a as a possibility for y'all. Appreciate it. Okay. Mayor Biggers. Um, as we look at the research plan proposal on municipal elections, I guess I'm curious why we're only focusing on municipal elections. I'll share with you, I spent Tuesday eight hours at the polls shaking hands and talking to people to find out what's working, what's not working, what, what they're mad about, and, and the few that said we're doing everything great, right? And one of the consistent comments I had was, Mayor, we have too many elections. How come we vote in May and August and November? Now, we vote in November. We do that by design because we want the cost efficiencies and we want people to vote in our municipal election when we have the greatest turnout. But if, we, if for the reasons that have been suggested that we ought to de determine in Nashville when municipalities conduct their elections. And, and I would argue that the conservative in me says that few things are more important than how we determine whom to, how we, the manner in which we select those we choose to authorize to govern us. And that local, the more local government is and the more local w the elections are controlled, the better. So there's a side of me that says, why don't we just allow local autonomy on that? And, and if they want to spend money poorly, then that's between that municipality and their, their citizens. But if we go down that road, and I'm not saying we should, why, shouldn't, why, why don't we just say, let's just have two? Let's do our, all of our primaries in August. We'll do all of our, we'll do the general in November. And then we, we avoid the cost. Everybody knows, you know, there are people who suggest that to me, and this is not, this is just very subjective what I'm told, that turnout would be higher if we didn't have so many elections. So I guess the, my question would be, why don't we, why are we just focusing our study on municipal elections? Maybe we should focus, if we do it, 
And again, once we do the study, we can talk about public policy and whether it ought to be a local decision. But I guess I would suggest we, we look at both county and municipal elections and, and whether we, not, we ought not simply try to get down to two. Chairman mm -hmm. Rigo. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Mayor, I, serving as a local chair, we have seen numerous, especially in your rural areas, where those cost savings m mean a lot. Uh, and we have seen numerous rural areas switch to the debate that you just held for a, a primary in August and in November. Some say that we have election fatigue. Uh, and you're right, some of the percentages that we have for voter turnout is embarrassing, quite frankly, to me to give, because if you, if you try to pass law to say, well, we're going to take your right away to vote if you haven't voted in the last so many elections, well, we'd be in an uproar. Uh, so uh, that's what we are... There's been several pieces of legislation that's wanted to be passed, but as sitting as a local chair, that's the debate that we hear with inside of our committee, and both from the Senate side, I believe, is, is the same uh, conversations of at what point do we put the restrictions on to where we go, but I think once we go down this road, it's, it's, it's more appropriate to can look at all of it rather than just the municipalities because... You know, the voter fatigue is something that's setting in. It seems like we have a special election for this and a, a special election for that all the time. But, uh, but, but I, I, I do agree with you. I think this is more of an embattlement uh, as most of the things that you see up here is rural versus urban. And because we've had a lot of rural areas come into the concept of saying, we're going to fall in line with doing a primary in August and our voting in, in November, and we feel that we'll get a better turnout because some of these turnouts, uh, it's embarrassing the money that we're spending on it and the number of people that are showing up uh, to get the results that we're looking for. So uh, that's, that's the reason why I think that we're seeing and having this discussion in front of us. Mayor Biggers to respond. Representative Wargo, I, I appreciate that. And I guess my point is, if four is too many, then why is three not too many? Maybe we, may, let's, maybe we should include the county primary as part of this study. And again, I'll be very upfront. I think we sh if, that if a municipality, that, that if we ought to allow them to do it as they choose, and if it's, if it's wasteful, then that's their call. But if we go down the path that that the legislature is going to dictate how we do these elections. I guess I would request that we include the not just municipal elections, but the county elections in this study as well. That's an interesting variation on the theme. So we have a we have a public chapter, or, or we have a, a formal request to do one thing, and it, I guess for efficiency's sake, it wouldn't hurt to to uh, be inclusive on it as long as the original mandate is met. Um, so I think that's fine. But we're on Amendment 2, then, in terms of the, the, the plan of work and how they go about it, then they'll take note of that. Any other questions or comments on that? All right. Is there a I've got some, question. I, yes, I've got yes, some questions about Section K. Okay. I don't know if we can talk about those separately or how. I, I defer, obviously, to the chair how you want to handle that. But that, 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 inst that instigated a lot of... Um, thought and probably a lot of, I bet a lot of discussion uh, of, of folks here, and I think that might be worthy of some and, and of, I think you're right. of discussion on its own. I think that is true, and we've got that under the next amendment, if I remember correctly. So that'll be under Amendment 3 for consideration, correct? Am I right about that? Okay. Yes. So on Amendment 2, for those we have before us. Mr. Please. Chairman, just for clarification, yes, so the only tab under Amendment 2 is the one on the elections then? Tobacco. No, tobacco. tobacco. Yeah, tobacco okay. and elections. Thank you. you bet. Okay. Chairman Yarbrough. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I appreciate uh, Mayor Bicker's comments there. I mean, this is one of those tricky issues that, um, you know, it's really easy for us to think about in the cost components, but I think uh, it's nice to, to think about its inclusion here because it does raise the local autonomy issues, but also 
Um, the, I mean, I think the challenge that you have in some of your, you know, regardless of size, is how do you communicate to voters about what's going on in the, you know, Parsons mayor's race if, if you've got a presidential debate going on at the same time? How do you break through the sort of the noise out there? And sort of while there's election fatigue, there can also be ballot fatigue. You know, and you start thinking about if, if you have an especially busy local election year at the same time that you've got all of your judicial races up at the same time, you're, you're, you know, at the same time you've got a couple constitutional amendments, you start having eight, nine, ten-page ballots, and you have drop-off and consideration issues. But uh, I just wanted to, since we had had like a little talk, I just think it's, it's useful to think about all of those things, and I just wanted to say that as background for uh, for this, for the team as we're as we're going through this, that like I think making this too much of a you know turnout versus money like might not be the right way to think about it completely just because there's so many of these yeah, issues. Yes, and that's some, there was some discussion along those lines in committee at the time we had the bill, which is why I think it was converted to a tasser look see. Good points though. Um, but again, on amendment two, any further questions? Is that I'll entertain a motion that we approve that amendment to the so plan of work. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon, seconded by Commissioner, mm, yes, Carter, thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? It's unanimous, unanimously approved. Amendment two, on to amendment three. Yes, and April, is she here? We have a handout. Hello. Okay, so now we're to the, um, Study of House Bill 971 by Sargent and Senate Bill 1075 by Watson. And uh, Nathan's already covered this. And he also mentioned that we had re <clears throat> sorry, received a letter from Chairman Sargent uh, related to this study that focuses this, this in uh, even more uh, than the direction from the committee, which was to answer the four, uh, four questions uh, related to the duties of cities, duties of counties, funds flowing to each to meet those responsibilities. So April is handing out a letter. And this in that letter. Is, yeah, Chairman Sargent's letter. Absolutely, May, yeah. Letter of May 1st that was written, and I think there have been a few modifications here, but Charles, do you want to, I don't know if you want to be recognized. Uh, you just, you want your letter. And again, sort of within the structure we had been operating under in terms of priorities, and any member of, of the commission is entitled to request a study, and the commission has usually been very accommodating. This is, is sort of a hybrid. We, we have the letter in addition to the original proposal, um, although it didn't pass both houses or anything like that, but it's, it's um, a, an important issue and it's timely too. So, uh, Chairman Sargent? No, I really don't want to, I think what they listed in their uh, background on the four things, I don't want to limit it, but I would also like to add it to streamline sales tax, because this is going to become more and more of an issue uh, every year. Uh, in fact, I, I'm wishing now that I made this more of an issue three years ago or two years ago so I could see the results come through, but uh, I just wanted to notify that I want this, you know, to be heard. So I wasn't trying to limit it. Uh, that way I want it, so it's on the calendar, and I just wanted to make sure we studied what we were doing. Mayor McDonald. Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate uh, the Chairman's uh, concern for uh, that portion of it. However, I do hope that as we go through this and as the Commission uh, studies this, that we're careful that we look at all of the funds. I don't think it's proper, appropriate, or telling for us just to look at state shared. I would like to do what the committee report says and see all of the funds that go to the cities and all of the funds that go to the state so we can determine how, in fact, those funds are being distributed and how those are being used 
And what are, uh, in, in the bill itself, uh, my good friend, Representative Carter, talked about what's required by law. Uh, and we know that in uh, one of the bills regarding um, our ability to annex, it talks about uh, nine specific things that we are required to do as cities. And so uh, I think we need to look. I, I want to be sure that we're looking at all of the funds and not just the Internet sa sales tax current, present, past, or future. Chairman Sargent, to respond. Uh, no, I, w I would agree totally. I don't think we're just looking at the internet sales tax. But I want everyone here to understand also, and I'm just going to give you one example, and I'm going to use Williams County since I know the numbers better than other counties. I know a lot of county numbers. But... In Williams County, we have about 230,000, population of about 230,000 people. Of those 230,000 people, 180,000 live inside a municipality. Brentwood, Franklin, Fairview, all the cities. 50,000 live outside or in the unincorporated areas. I'm going to use just one example. On state shared revenue, the municipalities get 97% of the money, only 3% goes to your unincorporated areas. So I have, in Williams County, 50,000 in the unincorporated areas, and they're getting 3% of the funding. So these are the things I don't think most people look at or understand. So I want the, I agree with you totally. I want the whole picture looked at. Um, I don't want to do anything that's going to basically, you could say, hurt a city. But, you know, everyone says, well, the halls tax hurt different cities. But yeah. the halls tax really didn't when you look at state shared revenue. You lost issue. the halls tax, and state shared revenues went from did not. Uh, $112, $115 per person to $125 a person. Mm -hmm. So when I balance that out, you actually came out more with state shared revenues than you did with the loss of Hall's tax. Now, that may not be true for Brentwood, and there's certain places, I'll, I'll grant you, I can point around the room and point around the state that that may not be true. But that's why I want to look at the entire picture. I don't want to hurt cities, but yet on the other hand, I think cities have to understand what's happening on school districts. And, you know, besides the half of the two and a Two and a quarter percent, one and one eighth goes to the city, one and one eighth goes to the school system. Well, that does not help, and you know, with most school systems now are really starting to run short, especially when you have a fast growing school system building thirty, fifty million dollars worth of buildings every single year. You know what the bond indebtedness will start adding up to uh, as far as that's concerned. And I want them to look at the entire picture, not just any one revenue source, but I think you know this has to be a broad study of everything. I, like I said, uh, one of the functions we were looking at this year even, we're just going to, and I didn't, think, I didn't think it was really fair just pushing the bill through. I may have had the votes, but uh, looking at phasing something in what we do over a five or a ten year period and not hurt not hurt anybody, just look at new revenues over the five or 10 year period and try to phase it in, you know, so I don't hurt a city. And I know your smaller cities are a lot different than a Brentwood or a Metro Nashville or a Shelby County. I, you know, they, I mean, we have to look at the entire picture. So yes, I, I do not disagree. We have to look at the entire picture. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I could, yes, I would just... I would just, uh, you know, include the idea that uh, to perhaps you even have to look at where the money is coming from. The municipalities are the economic drivers for the state. That's where the businesses locate. That's where the jobs are. 
You like the small businesses of government. A absolutely, uh, uh, in, in many ways. But we have the small businesses within our cities and have to provide them services and education for their children. So, um, I mean, we could get uh, e even larger by, by looking at the situs-based of where these internet sales are coming from, and I would suggest they would probably be in the more urbanized area, and since we know so much of the rural area, we've talked about it in our forums here, don't have access to broadband, obviously they're not buying on the internet, from home at least. They will be. Yeah, <laughs> so I mean, we have, we, I just wanna be sure we're looking at the entire picture uh, we have been hurt as cities. We have not been made whole. We are limping, and in, this would be something of a death nail, in my opinion, uh, for many cities across the state. That's not my intent whatsoever. So please, let me assure, if you're a city mayor, that is not my intent. I don't think the, that's the intent of the thought process of the people doing this. Uh, we want, that's why we want to work together. And I'm not going to get into any particular city. Uh, and I, I know the numbers, like I said, for Williamson County, I know the numbers, you know, when you look at some of these rural counties, they're receiving seventy-six, seventy-seven hundred dollars $7,700 per student per year. I got a county over in uh, East Tennessee that's receiving $2,950 a student per student per year. So I have one at $2,900 and one at $7,500, $7,600. You know, and we say we justify it because of the wealth of the county. And that's not Williams County, the one that's getting 29. They, we're on the low end of the scale, but we're not at 29. Uh, so, you know, yes, I agree. We have to look at that. And why, how, how do I expect that school system to survive on $2,950 per student compared to another school system getting $7,500, $7,600, $7,700 per student per year. Mr. Mayor, Chairman. Yeah, uh, well, I've got Mayor Vickers looking for okay. recognition here. And, uh, he yields. And we we can talk later. No running we, debate. We, we will. No, no, I, no I, I just, uh, um, well, go ahead, and I'll, I'll come back to it, if, and then we'll talk on the side if we need to. Okay, thank you. Mayor Vickers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I suspect that if all the cities and all the counties would be very happy to agree to what they feel is fair and equitable, and that should be our goal, because I, I, I will share with you one of the most disturbing things about my experience has been the tension between cities and counties. We should all be working together for the common good of the public. But it seems like we can't, we are so, we're so focused on the tension between us and what we want and, and what, you know, as opposed to let's focus on what's fair and equitable. Because I think if we could reach that, we'd all be in agreement, and, and the state would be a hell of a lot better off for it. But to do that, I think we, we have to take a, we have to do a full analysis of the entire revenue system of the state like we're talking about, because we've got revenues that are raised directly by the municipalities, we've got revenues raised directly by the county, we have shared resources, we have, rev we have monies that go directly from the state to, to the counties. There are, there are various revenue sources, and we ought to be able, when we are spending someone else's money, and we're taking someone else's, we ought to be able to say, here's the public policy reason all right, why we choose to tax this activity, why we choose to tax these people in this level. The only way to do that is if we take a comprehensive look. I don't know whether you call it a tax commission, whatever you call it, but a comprehensive look at how we go about raising the revenues that we need to fund both state and local and county and, and municipal governments. And if we do it in the right way, we, we, 
it will be something that we, we can relieve the tension, we can stop fighting about money, but to do that, I mean, let me just suggest, we can't just say, I want to talk about state shared, right? Because I may want to talk about the direct monies that go to the counties, right? And, and, do, and, and, and what about cities who, like mine who say, we're going to make it go without a property tax? Well, when you cut our halls tax, when you cut f f sales tax on food, you're making me decide, you know, we think a property tax is one of the most inequitable taxes there is when you say we're only going to tax one form of property, right? But when you make the decision in the vacuum, you make it very difficult on us because it's a, there are two sides of the ledger. You pull money away, we either have to raise it somewhere else or we have to stop, we have to reduce the services we provide. So that is why I would strongly encourage this, and, and I don't know that we can do it by January. No. But I would encourage this commission to do, to take this as an opportunity to do a full study and look at the public policy issues behind the different revenue sources, because not only has the internet changed, and it's gonna change, all right? You only have to walk down and see the, the blighted buildings in, in our cities and even in our counties, okay? To understand business has changed, but it's gonna change even more. All right, we're talking about broadband. Well, we're about to get, they're investing billions in broadband. They're going to do away with cable and satellite. That money's gone. And that's even going to further change how, how money, how we have to focus on our revenue. So, that, Mr. Chairman, that is what I, I would encourage this commission. Let's be proactive and let's look at this issue, not in a vacuum, but very broadly with the hope that we can, we can come up with a recommendation that everybody will find to be fair and equitable. Thank you, Mayor, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Sergeant. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mayor. I do not disagree. In, let me use one thing. In Williamson County, all municipalities and counties work very close together. I'm going to give you an example of what just happened in Williamson County. We've increased, we put it on a referendum to increase our sales tax from nine and a quarter to 9.75. Now, normally speaking, it's going to be hard to get a tax increase through. It passed in Williamson County two to one, 66% of the votes. But the agreement with our municipalities, and they all agreed to it, was for the first three years, where they, on that half percent increase, they would get half and we'd get half, so they'd get a quarter, we'd get a quarter. Every municipality inside of Williamson County agreed that we will forego our quarter percent increase for three years. Right now, they've agreed to three years. They may look at something after the three years are up, and that money all had to go to the school system. Now. That's what I call good working relationship. So I give Brentwood, Franklin, Spring Hill, Thompson Station, Fairview, Nolensville, a great deal of credit because they didn't have to do that. And they did, and that's why with the buy-in from the county, the school system, and our cities, why it passed by a two-to-one majority, normally you don't see that on increase in taxes. So, I agree that we all have to work together. This cannot be a one-way street. I don't care if it's the county, the city, or anything else. So I, I agree with you 150%. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you all. So it occurs to me that the, the only way to do this um, adequately, it would be to sort of anticipate a due date more along the lines of, of January 20 rather than January 19. If you try to rush this, it's going to be a a mess. That doesn't mean we couldn't have some presentations or panel discussions about it, much like we're having here today. At this year, we could we could either in the August or December maybe meeting have some presentations about it, and um, um, that might be sort of spoon feeding some of these folks who are running for governor to think about some serious issues for a change. But that's for others to decide. Um, but that would give you a full year. I think to to really absorb some of this, don't you agree, Representative Love? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're on Amendment Three, and I'm glad we thrashed that out a bit. Um, is there any further discussion? I hope not. I think we will just 
with all considered, uh, I'll entertain a, a motion. <laughs> we, okay, that's J Chairman Yarbrough. I think he moved it. Uh, moved approval amendment three. Is there a second? Isla? Oh, Mayor Bickers, thank you very much. Mr. Any further discussion? Yes, yes. Further discussion? Clarification. Yes, you yes. So you're, you're adding where it says no due date specified, you're adding a date of January. I just did that, yeah. Right. I, just, I thought we should have an objective. And that expands the scope. It expands the scope, yes. And if you think this is going to be fun, where do we get back to BEP? Yes, Charles. I'd like to see the study January of 19. Cause I think a bill is going to come out. And Whether we do I want or everyone not. to have the input into this. So I just do not pu push out to, to 20. Because I, I sincerely believe there will be a bill if all the parties would sit down. And I think if all the parties sit down, I think we can get a good working bill. If not, what's going to happen, I'm, I'm afraid, is that a bill is going to be pushed out and not have the proper input from our cities and well, That's a else. good point. That's a good point. And, and the chair takes note of that. And it may be that in anticipation, trying to head off a bad bill, you, you have a, an initial due date then of January uh, of 2019 with the understanding that it's more than likely you'll get some preliminary results that may be helpful for the next session, but that you're, it's going to require more study and, and a broader look. Um, but that's just my impression of it. Isla? Commissioner McMahon? Yeah. Right thing. There, there you go. go. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just uh, should we then, if we're not going to have it in 2020, we're going to have a January 19. Should we at, be calling for a draft of it, an initial draft by 19, considering there's going to be discussion further on, or we just want a full finished product by uh, the ninth, uh, by 2019? Well, I think this, this reminds me of the broadband situation where we had legislation pushing us. Sure. Um, so... I think, well, I don't know how to respond to that. Um, Chairman Yarbrough. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I mean, I think we have to appreciate both concerns here. Yep. Um, I mean, we're slated to meet two times, really, before January. Right. Right? Yep. And, and have significant other business to do. Right. And so, I mean, I'm just trying to think through the final preliminary piece perhaps and I mean it's like I understand exactly what you're saying that we want to be able to give feedback before um, somebody just calls off and passes a bill um, about you know it's focused right. on one particular thing but um, but, but we, we just broaden the scope too and so I want to be mindful yeah. that like it's a lot of work for I mean I feel like this group of people this is a great task for Tasser, I feel like the people who were assembled up here could we, spend both of our next meetings on nothing but this and have plenty to talk we should about. Ha we should be our own panel. We can present to ourselves with the talent here. <laughs> Let, Charles? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand where you're coming from. I asked all the parties to start meeting last year. Some of them met but they only wanted to meet for an hour or two hours. And that's why a bill almost got passed this year, folks. Because if the parties don't want to come to the table, it doesn't matter what we do. If the parties still don't want to come to the table, you might as well rip it all up. So, you know, that's why I'm saying I'd rather have the report by January. I'm not saying it has to be the final draft, but yet, I don't want to see something just get put off and get, again now for another year and a half. We're looking at 19 months putting something off. And I don't think that's what we, 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 we need to do because I'm afraid of what's going to happen. I know the members on this committee do not sit there in the legislature and vote on some of this stuff. But, I mean, there was a push last year for me to move this bill out. And it was sitting in finance. So, I, you know, and that's not the way I operate. Uh, I didn't think it was the right thing. It's not the way my colleagues on both sides of me that sit on finance want to work. So that's why, you know, 
I think the due diligence maybe on this committee and on the staff, maybe it's a little higher priority than, you know, maybe some other bills out there. It's no different than the broadband. You know, we spent $15 million. We didn't have everything in place on the broadband last, you know, last year. So, I mean, I, I should think we can work if the people know we have a deadline and not just going to play games with the bill. Okay, I've got Commissioner McMahon and then Chairman Yarbrough. Um, uh, um, Leader Sergeant, I, I totally understand. I get it, and and uh, and I agree with you. The the only thing that I'm thinking is we we want to make sure that we've got the time and that staff has the time to put together exactly what we need to do and what we need to be considering on this body to re, uh, to present to the legislature and, and not be bum rushing something that's that really needs to be more time and hasn't been fleshed out. That was. That was my only concern about maybe having an initial draft or some preliminary findings or something like sure. that. that. That's all, Mr. Sure. Chairman. No, I get it. I'll recognize uh, Chairman Yarbrough and then Representative Love. No, I, I think uh, Chairman Sergeant uh, raises an important point. Uh, that I guess trying to... Is there, is there a difference between uh, us getting to a place of having kind of preliminary findings as opposed to, like, the preliminary draft? Right, because right. um, that because those might be different things. I think they would be. Dr. Lippard, would you like to weigh in on this? It, as the as the issue's gotten more and more comprehensive with with every speaker, uh, I think we would be <laughs> really hard pressed to deliver the the kind of quality report and recommendation that the commission expects by January 19. However, I think we could uh, could with a series of perhaps a panel at our at our next meeting, uh, an update at our December meeting, and then uh, a, a list of preliminary findings at the January 19 meeting, something that, that to, to at least give some direction where we're going. I'm not sure how far we'll, we'll make it in any of those. It kind of depends on the, di the, the direction the commission gives us over the next few meetings, but and then work from that, similar to what we did with the broadband report, similar to what we did with the annexation report, work from that towards a, a final report at some point after January 2019. That would inform legislation that you want to have, I mean, that may go forward then, the beginning of the 111th General Assembly. Um, I've got Dr. Love and then Chairman Wergo, Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I'm going to express the same concerns I had when we were I think dealing with this in finance the last couple of weeks, is that right? It's the same. Well, it, it was in finance last year. Right. It was in full finance last year, and people turned around and said, we'll work over the summer and over the winter. And I don't want to start picking on anybody, so please, I'm not going to do it. But then all of a sudden, there was a group that didn't want to work. Right. I'm just trying to reorientate myself. This also <coughs> almost came from before us a few weeks ago, right? This is the same. Yeah. I'm just trying Correct. to get clarity on that. And, and, and so I want to express my same concerns because, uh, particularly with Metro Nashville, um, the assumption may be made that because we're Metro Nashville, Davidson County, that it would not affect us. But that's not true because we have satellite cities that would then, I think, be affected by this, uh, like Berry Hill and others who uh, would have a substantial amount of their dollars taken away to be given to the county of Davidson for education purposes. So as we, as we talk about these things, I want us to also think about the effect that it would have on Metro Nashville, Davidson County, with its satellite cities. Uh, I don't know, I mean to sure. add any more complication, Dr. Lippert, to the... Uh, ongoing conversation, but I do think we need to make that Definitely. point heard uh, that you can't just say Nashville is going to be all right because it's Davidson County and Nashville because there are, again, satellite cities where schools are located, but the, the city, uh, the satellite city doesn't really uh, put money toward it, and then the money would come from that satellite city to go to the county to pay for the school and education piece, and that's a huge amount of money particularly, again, like just taking a city like Berry Hill, it's a huge amount of money coming from them to then fund uh, a school near them that's in the county of Davidson, even though you have that satellite. So I just want to raise that point as we discuss uh, going forward this issue of, of equity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well put. 
Chairman Orgo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are two senators on this committee and four representatives, and the being a campaign year, we don't know where we will be coming back. But as one person stood on the House floor and said one day that you need 51 votes in the House and 17 in the Senate to get something done and then a signature by the governor. When we put out the word for the TASA report for the broadband, I stood firm with this committee and didn't support any legislation uh, that come before uh, the body in respect to this committee, because I know the, the work that they do, but at least sent a message, because we had some prelim preliminary reports, but at least sent the message that we were working on something. And, and, and Mr. Chairman, you yourself pointed out that, you know, it was, it was a roadmap uh, for a start, not necessarily what exactly was going to happen, but at least it was a roadmap. And I think if we go into the session and if some of those members that are sitting on this committee are allowed to return uh, and we send a message to the body that we are looking at this with these steps in mind, only preliminary, preliminary, maybe we can ward off some of the legislation, bad legislation that may come out or some could say it would be good legislation because I, can't, I do know this, there's going to be a tremendous turnover in this body. There will be up to as many as 30 new members, if not more, and with the House and the Senate combined. And I think that we ought to look hard at that and take this in consideration when we're looking about whether we want hardcore reports, which I think would be almost an uh, undaunting task to try to perform. You'd, you'd have to have a team of people that's going to work on this thing night and day to the end to get something finalized by January, but we, I think we at least need to have something put into place to try to have some weapons to ward off any bad legislation that might come out of it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Sargent, I see your finger on that button. I, the, the only reason I hate to say preliminary, because there again, it's going to end up being 2020-2021. Because if I don't want and my organization turns around and says, I didn't want to participate. And no one's going to blast their own organization if they didn't participate. Uh, I may sit here and blast them, but, but I, 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 I'm refraining from what happened last year for the last 12 months. Because I do not want to blast anybody. Because I want this to be a working. And I think... If we sit down and work on it, we can get this worked out. You know, it, this is not Einstein. This is not, you know, I'm not trying to send a rocket to the moon or, or anything else. I mean, you know, this is, you know, when you look at it, this is going to come down to dollars and cents. And I totally understand that. Totally, totally understand that. But I want people to also understand that just by pushing it off, What's going to happen, we're going to end up with something that I'll even say if it was my bill, the Charles Sargent may not be happy with. And, you know, when it comes to something like that, I, so I'm just trying to, you know, I, I just don't want to put it off because I think something's going to happen. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to use Davidson County for an example. Everyone thinks Davidson County gets all this funding for schools. Well, I have another bill out there that would help seven, seven school districts. If I told you the seven, you'd say, how would that happen? I'll tell you, the seven is Chattanooga, Knox, and they're all in the same boat. Different, they're all in the same boat as far as funding. Chattanooga, Knox, uh, Davidson, Williamson, Franklin Special School District, and... The one over you. Or, uh, is it only gets twenty nine dollars, twenty nine hundred on it. Yeah, yeah. Hamilton County. No, uh, and there's another. The one that only gets twenty nine hundred. It's uh, Blunt County or over in, over in that area. So those six school districts, and so you're looking at three of the big metropolitan school districts. They don't get eighty percent of the average funding. 
And you wouldn't think, you how, how are you going to compare, say, a Davidson to a Williamson, and they don't get 80% of the school funding? 99% of the people don't understand that. And that's what, you know, so it, it that's what I'm trying to say. I got it. Do not recognize me again, please, I the won't. chairman. Fear not. Oh, Mayor Bickers. Uh, one last thing, and, and I, I appreciate the urgency of getting something done, and nobody wants to see a bad piece of legislation out of frustration that people aren't acting as quickly as we would like. But I think we'd be better off to make sure we got a good, solid report that can serve the legislature for many years to come as opposed to putting something together in haste to try to meet a uh, legislative right. deadline, keeping in mind that the Supreme Court may throw a huge wild card in the That's mix. Right. And, right. and, you know, who knows if they'll decide the issue, what they will decide, when they will decide it, which may, that may well hit us in the fall, which might make it even more problematic to try to have anything. So I appreciate that. I would encourage this committee to work diligently um, and you know, forward on this because I think it is, it is one of the most significant things that, that we can do and a great thing that we can do for the legislature and the state. And so, but I would just hope that we act not with too much haste, but, but prepare the best report that we can prepare. Thank you. No, I appreciate all the input. And I think the, the motion for, to approve Amendment 3 or this item should be for, you know, a, a report in, you know, in January, we're not going to specify whether it's the final report or a preliminary report, but a report date, and who knows, maybe it'll be final, Charles, you know, maybe it'll be preliminary. Um, we'll just have to wait and see, but, but I think the members, the legislative members of TASSER can certainly go forth and say that this is in process, whether you, whether you like where TASSER is or not in January, um, it'll, it'll have a, an effect, um, and it may be final at that point. But um, let's shoot for January and subject to amendment, you know, subject to what's required to get the best work product out. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and vote on this. I don't want to lose members, but we'll, we'll to accommodate the, the, the chairman and, and the, the maker of the request, along with the committee, um, we'll, we'll ask for a report date of January 2019 with the understanding that they may the report may say here here are preliminary findings and we need more time I don't know what else to do all right any uh, any further questions or comments that the amendment is under if that's all right with you yep. all right without objection yeah I think that serves all the purposes here all in favor signify by saying aye, aye. any opposed or abstaining well it's unanimous in the tasser way um, we, we have do, one more item. We, is it the letter from it is. Senator Nicely? Uh, April, could you hand that out, please, ma'am? And the letter from Senator Nicely is to, as I took it, really is to, is to sort of update a report that had previously been done on, um, oh, voter verification. Um, right. Trust but verify. Yeah. And without any, yes, yes. I know. I we think all this have is that. important. We all have that. Email have. from Homeland Security. Wait, Chairman Wargo, I know we have that, and I was going to address oh, that here momentarily. I, I want to get through the voting business so that okay. so that we don't. Uh, but thank you for accommodating the chair on that. Uh, so uh, Senator Nicely has uh, made a request that we we update that that study. I believe we could probably do it by a staff a, a staff report update this this type of request without any reflection upon the the maker of it is, is sort of the lowest level of priority it's a it's a sort of a one-off it doesn't come by a bill it doesn't come from a committee it's a it's a personal request it, it's addressed to both um, me and chairman Yarborough um, I think it's a, a fine request but I'd, I'd rather handle it m more informally if if we could if there's no objection to that Jeff do you let the members take a look at it here, but I mean, uh, the obviously this issue has changed significantly since the time of the report, and so I just want to make sure that, like, if 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 this is something that the staff, you know, can and and and, and plan to undertake, I think that's fine. So talking with Dr. Lippard, um, he indicated that he thought that was doable. 
and, and would be satisfactory. So I don't think we need to vote on it. Cliff, do you have anything to yeah. add? Uh, I don't think so, Mr. Chairman. I, I would just ask that maybe this is one that we leave open-ended on on when, because the staff is going to have to kind of work it in around other other projects um, with with you know, imminent due dates. But I, I believe this is the kind of information we, we could get fairly quickly, but I don't want to make uh, make promises until I see how, how difficult it is to get that information since we just got this request. Okay. So I don't think we need to take any formal yeah. action on it. Yep. And, and, uh, and that would complete the items, not all the items on the agenda, but for which votes are required. And, and before we get to tab six, Chairman Wargo had sought recognition on the, um, the, the fact that we have another um, active shooter situation in Nashville uh, at Opry Mills and um, you know the reports are just coming in it's um, it's um, there, there have been injuries uh, and and there is I guess one um, alleged shooter has been apprehended but perhaps another has not and so it's unfolding and it's unsettling to everyone here and uh, and every everyone across the state, but I appreciate Chairman Wergo allowing me to get on through the votes because if there are people who feel like they need to step out to make phone calls or, or whatever you may need to do, feel free to do that at this time. We'll just uh, keep everybody in our prayers, as we say, and um, hope for the best in a bad situation. Having said that, let's go to tab six. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Michael. Chairman, thank you. Uh, commissioners, my name is Michael Mount, and I'll be giving the up annual update on fiscal capacity found on tab six. And if you want to follow along, the presentation is after the tables. And I, I believe there's also a handout. Uh, before I begin on fiscal capacity, I'll, I'll give a brief summary of the basic education program. The uh, basic education program, or BEP, is the state's uh, education funding formula. It's used to determine the amount needed by each school system to fund education. It has four components and each component has a local share and a state share. And uh, on the slide here, the, these are the shares uh, uh, that represent this, for, that are for the state overall. Um, looking at the non-classroom cost, it's 50% local and 50% state. Uh, and the, and for this one, the the local share is capped at 75 percent um, and my point there was that th this is for the state overall the the percentages for a specific school system will be different uh, based on its fiscal capacity I'll now, fiscal capacity is a measure of a county's ability to pay for education from its own sources. It's a county level model, and that means that for counties with more than one school system, uh, the fi they are treated as if they have the same fiscal capacity. The TASSER model is calculated using multiple regression analysis and that's used to determine the weights for the five components of the model, which I'll discuss in the next few slides. And these weights are then multiplied by each county's actual values for those five components. Here are the factors, beginning with the own source revenue, and then the tax basis first sales tax base per student and the equalized property assessment per student. Uh, then there's equalized residential and farm assessment as a 
percentage of the total equalized assessment and per capita income. Finally, the service burden, which is uh, the number of students or average daily membership divided by the population of the county. And here's how each of the factors relate to fiscal capacity for the tax bases and per capita income increases uh, correspond to increases in fiscal capacity. And then for the residential and farm as a share of the total property assessment and the service burden increases correspond with decreases in fiscal capacity. I'll begin discussing the, the trends uh, in counties fiscal capacity. Uh, and I, I will highlight uh, one of the biggest changes that I saw this year, which was in Trousdale County. And here is the uh, prison in, in Trousdale County, and it affects fiscal capacity because it's privately owned and it's part of the commercial tax base. Uh, the assessment for the prison uh, is 54.1 million and before that uh, in fiscal year 2015 the total industrial commercial assessment for Trousdale was 17.3 million and so now in fiscal year 2016 the total is uh, 73.7 million and so you can see that most of the increase was because of the, the prison. And here is uh, Trousdale County's percentage of the state total fiscal capacity. You can see the increase in the last year. It's caused by the uh, addition of the prison to the county's tax base. And because we use a three-year average, we would expect increases in the next two years as well. Uh, the bump, the increase, and then the, the d decrease uh, in some of the prior years I discussed uh, a year, year or two ago, uh, that had to do with per capita in income and the subsequent revision to it. It was overstated for a few years and then revised down. Here are the trends in the county's fiscal capacities. Um, green uh, represents increasing percentage of the state's fiscal capacity. Blue means it's staying about the same, and then yellow is a decrease in a percentage of the state's fiscal capacity. An important point here is that it's all relative to what the state's doing overall, so if you're keeping pace with the state, you'll be blue. If your fiscal capacity is growing faster, then then you're green and, and same with yellow. Uh, um, as uh, Deputy Director Melissa Brown mentioned earlier, we made a recommendation as part of our pilots report that we published in January uh, related to fiscal capacity and it had to do with the uh, payment in lieu of tax uh, data that's used in fiscal capacity and here on the screen I have the exact wording of that recommendation. Now pilots data are used both in the TASSER and the CBER model but TASSER use the TASSER model uses tax equivalent payment data that hasn't been updated since 1995 and CBER uses uh, up-to-date IDB assessment data. And here, here's some of the effects of going from the 1993-95 tax equivalent payments data to the IBD, IDB pilots data, uh, which, as I mentioned, CBER already uses. Uh, and as with any change in fiscal capacity, some counties uh, 
would increase in their percentage of the statewide fiscal capacity and others would decrease. And uh, this is what, what, what is on your handout. And the final issue, uh, we'll look again at the virtual school in Union County. Uh, it is reduced uh, union's revenue per student. The blue line is their actual revenue per ADM, and then the red line is what it would have been without the virtual school students. And we just bring this up to show, uh, to emphasize that uh, fiscal capacity is zero sum. In other words, uh, if one county's percentage of the state total fiscal capacity increases, then the uh, others must decrease. That is my presentation. Are there any questions? Questions? Uh, Mayor Huffman. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Michael, let me ask you on the BEP funding, the, uh, it's a little under $7 billion total state and local. Is that about right? A little under $7 billion, about four and a half of that state? Uh, the remainder is local. That sounds about right, yeah. It's about right. Yeah. The, at the end of the day, when the computations are made and the allocations are made and the systems get their funding, it's never a wash. There's money left over. What happens to the money, the BEP, that's left over? Where does it go? I'm struggling to understand what you're referring to. Yeah. Want to answer? Hello, Michael. I'm not sure I'm clear on the question about money left over. Well, in let's see, my number in twenty. Fiscal year 2016, $20.4 million of BE funding had not been spent at the end of the year. If that's the case, does it necessarily follow that that money has to revert to the general fund? Does it stay in the Department of Education? Or is there some group, some part of the General Assembly or the administration that decides within the Department of Education where that money would go? So, so that, are you talking about the state level calculation for each school system, whether all that money is distributed? Yes. It's my understanding that it is. So it, it's, it's, it's calculated, they determine the state share, and then there's a series of payments throughout the fiscal year to school systems. So the state hasn't diverted four and a half million dollars that was transferred to the early childhood education program, for example, in the Department Out of Education. Out of the BEP money? Yes. Not to my knowledge. All right. And $20.4 million of BEP funding wasn't diverted, uh, reverted back to the general fund. In that year. I, I think we're, we're getting into territory. I'd be more comfortable having the Department of Education come address because this is right. yeah. outside our purview of fiscal capacity. It's more My understanding is question. there was always money that reverted back and that it usually reverted back to the general fund or through something else decided to do with that. Chairman Sarge. Mr. Chairman, you know more about that yeah. than I do. I, I may be able to answer it. If it was before, after school and before school programs, that comes out of the scholarship money. So if they did not use all that money, that money would be reverted back to the scholarship. It would not be general fund money or BEP money. I don't know if that answered your... But, all right. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. Right. All right. Yep. This makes, I mean, BEP funding makes the previous issue look like child's play, right? <laughs> Say, has anybody talked to you about juvenile justice reform? No, never mind. <laughs> Aside from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how'd you like the play? <laughs> Cliff, did you want to say anything? Uh, I was just going to say we could we can get with the department and see if we can get a, a clearer answer for for our next meeting. <laughs> All right, this is good. Um, thank you. I don't see any further questions here. All right, so we're scheduled to come back tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, 
another good day's work, beginning with the, the food deserts issue, which is, um, is also a very important issue, despite my personal involvement in the legislation for it. But if there's nothing further for the good of the order today, we will recess until 8.30 tomorrow morning. See you then.